First of all, thank you very much, Katya, for uh, the kind invitation, and thank you very much for this kind introduction. And most, most of all, thank you very much for organizing this very nice seminar series, which is, I think, a fantastic thing and maybe one of the very few good things uh, of Corona. Okay, so uh, I would like to use this opportunity to present um, some new results with um, Herbert Koch from the University of Bonn and Miko Salo from the University of Ivaskula on um, stability or rather instability mechanisms for um, um, some classes of inverse problems, some classes meaning um, elliptic, parabolic, hyperbolic problems. So I, I am not interested in trying to really compute uh, singular values, but try to understand mechanisms that hold um, for a larger class uh, of problems. Okay, so uh, the focus of the talk, uh, just as maybe the last two uh, talks in the seminar uh, will be on stability. So, uh, I mean, of course, there are more questions uh, one could ask, but uh, for the purpose of the talk and um, also most parts of the article, we're simply taking uniqueness for granted for the moment and um, um, also don't worry about uh, implications, for instance, for more practical things like reconstruction or stuff like that. So we really are interested mainly in the in isolating the, the effects of instability in this um, article and the talk. Okay, so the problem uh, I want to address or look into um, is of course a very well-known problem um, in inverse problems that um, they are often very ill-posed. And um, so very roughly speaking, the kind of um, question that uh, we are addressing in this article and um, in this talk is, whether one can somehow systematically understand um, the origins of instability in a quantitative way. So understand um, for larger classes of problems without computing singular values, without resorting to specific geometries, whether one can understand um, the mechanisms of instability. Okay, so um, in order to um, fix notation, let me go um, slowly and recall something that is of course very well known. So um, I will in the sequel look at an inverse problem um, modeled through the format operator, so through the direct problem mapping, um, this may be linear or nonlinear, mapping between uh, some uh, metric Banner, Hilbert, whatever you like, space X, to some other metric Banner, Hilbert, whatever you like, uh, space Y. I will always in the talk assume that uh, this map is injective. So again, I'm not bothering about uniqueness but we'll un uh, try to understand um, the strength of instability in a sense. And of course, it's very well known um, that a lot of inverse problems are very unstable. I mean, the most uh, basic situation is simply that of um, a linear operator mapping between say two infinite dimensional Banach spaces. Then uh, the inverse problem often is uh, the inverse of a very well posed physical uh, problem. So uh, for instance, if the operator is compact linear uh, injective, then clearly its inverse cannot have good mapping properties. So there must be inherent instability. And uh, even numerically, once you can see this uh, very um, uh, quickly, also already with very simple one dimensional examples. So one example uh, for which I have here plotted the situation is um, that of maybe one's favorite singular integral operator, say the Hilbert transform and uh, looking at kind of truncated Hilbert transform, one sees this effect very strongly. So if one measures um, or if one looks at functions supported in some interval i and measures on some uh, disjoint interval um, j, the truncated Hilbert transform, so just the restriction of the Hilbert transform to this set, one sees this instability very strongly already by plotting only two functions in the sense that, well, I mean, if you take a function which doesn't oscillate, then the Hilbert transform is uh, rather large, for instance, in an L2 norm. So you can control the original function through the Hilbert transform. But as soon as you go to more oscillatory data, you will see that there's a lot of cancellations and the Hilbert transform here in this picture is already very, very small. So a constant that seeks to control this in let's say an L2 norm, it has to be very large. And of course, what you see are the singular values of this, in this case, uh, linear mapping giving rise to instability. Okay, but of course, it's also very well known um, how one can deal with this. Um, one can simply say, okay, instead of looking at this um, mapping from this Banach infinite dimensional, say Banach or Hilbert or whatever you like, space X to uh, the space Y, let's restrict ourselves to um, a compact subset of this space um, X. And then uh, by general uh, um, topological nonsense, if you like, 
you will immediately get that uh, the restriction of this operator to this uh, compact set K is uh, continuously invertible with a uniform modulus of continuity omega K. And so in this Hilbert transform uh, situation, this is just a situation that, I mean, you're not allowing two um, um, oscillatory data. So this maybe you don't allow by this, um, you may still um, allow. So, and this is uh, in fact now all the um, uh, players that uh, I would like to consider for the talk. So um, uh, again, we're looking at uh, the inverse problem as the inverse of some forward map. So this is the map F between some spaces X and Y. And of course for X and Y, we could have different uh, choices. And we choose, again, this is a choice, some compact set K in um, X and ask ourselves, okay, we know that we get this uh, modulus of continuity omega K. What are the conditions dictated by these uh, choices we made? So by the um, um, operator F, linear or nonlinear, this compact set K and this choices of the spaces. So how ill-posed is the problem? And uh, if you think of the, um, Hilbert transform setting, the Hilbert or the truncated Hilbert transform setting we just saw, then, and the heuristics of these compact linear operators, then one thing one can come up with, and of course, this is something that is also not well known in the literature, is if you have smoothing, some kind of regularization. So, for instance, in the Hilbert transform setting, this is an analytically regularizing operator, then it's of course clear that this operator is very compact, so its inverse should be very bad. And uh, so the question, one question one could uh, then uh, for, as a particular question ask somehow is whether, well, if you're in particular in lower regularity, so some components of this thing is less regular, then is it still um, the case that we are so strongly unstable or um, is it possible somehow to get better uh, properties? And so these um, uh, questions I would like to address, um, but I would like to address them by looking at um, three prototypical examples. So the um, results hold from in a more general setting, but I think it's uh, probably uh, um, most instructive to, to uh, look at this in terms um, of examples. Okay, so the first example um, I want to like to look at is maybe the most boring inverse problem one can think of and the uh, most obvious inverse problem that one can think of, uh, which however, if one, um, changes the formulation a little bit does become interesting in this um, um, stability question. So uh, let me um, just state the problem. I'm interested here in um, the heat equation, just linear heat equation, nothing happening on uh, some bounded open domain omega, say, or a closed manifold, if you prefer, which then has sufficiently regularity. So say an analytic nice manifold, if you want to avoid boundary terms, and uh, the direct problem is just the problem uh, that one teaches in any PDE course. So the question, initial data to uh, final data. And the inverse problem is, of course, a very well-studied inverse problem of which one knows it's very, very unstable. It's the question, uh, final data to initial data. What type of instability does this have? As I said, it is very well known. And uh, so, of course, the heat equation is a, uh, in this um, setting a very, very strongly uh, regularizing operator. It's analytically regularizing. So if you uh, think of uh, this initial heuristics, it's a very, very strongly compact operator. So of course, it's expected and known that this uh, inverse problem is, in fact, very, very unstable, uh, logarithmically, uh, exponentially unstable. The modulus is not better than logarithmic. And this, uh, of course, you see also if you simply uh, expand uh, your solution in terms of uh, the eigenvalues of the uh, Laplacian or Laplace Beltrami operator, you see exponential damping in your solution, while whatever compact set you take as um, a space, let's say on a Sobolev scale, this compensates this exponential factor only by some uh, power growth. So no chance to uh, get better than this um, exponential instability. And of course, um, this is known and uh, it is known that if you look at this simple uh, linear parabolic inverse problem in some Sobolev space, you cannot do better than logarithmic the power depending maybe on this choice of S. And again, with the initial heuristic, it's not so surprising. The operator is analytically smoothing. So um, it is very, very uh, compact in the forward situ uh, situation and thus the inverse should be very, very bad. And this in fact is very, very bad if you think of numerics. Okay, but let me modify the problem a very little bit. And um, this now makes it um, 
much more interesting and uh, bothered um, I, uh, us for, for quite a while. So uh, if we, instead of looking at the constant coefficient heat equation, now add some coefficient. And this coefficient may now be of low regularity. So a coefficient which depends on time and space. So no the separation of variables anymore. And um, then what uh, still, let's look at the same um, inverse, still linear inverse uh, problem of trying to recover uh, the initial data from uh, the final data. Okay, and uh, now, of course, in contrast to the situation before, um, there's only minimal amount of smoothing. So, I mean, we still, of course, have energy estimates at our disposal, but not more in general. I mean, not uh, substantially more. So in particular, no longer have analytic uh, smoothing, no analytic uh, regularization. So the question I would like to um, address and the question I would like to keep in mind as one of the model problems or model settings is whether in this simple situation where we simply change the problem from as nice as you like coefficients to much less nice coefficients, is there still this exponential instability as in the heat equation or is it possible to somehow find coefficients, I mean, maybe think of a random medium or something which uh, you could expect maybe to have some kind of memory or whatever, whether this um, uh, is possible to find coefficients with better mapping properties. Okay, so this is the first problem I would like to keep in mind. And uh, before, however, turning to um, uh, the uh, solution of this problem, let me turn to a second uh, model problem, which of course is again, a very well known and well studied um, inverse problem. So this is now an, an elliptic um, nonlinear inverse problem going back to Alberto Calderon and uh, is the problem whether from um, surface voltage to current measurements of the conducting body, one can infer information on the medium within the inside of this body. So mathematically, once more, although uh, I guess everybody in the audience knows this uh, very well. So that's the set situation of uh, conducting body omega. We impose um, surface uh, voltages, so just directly data. Then in the absence of sources and sinks of charge, the uh, potential will satisfy a conductivity equation and we measure the um, um, surface uh, currents. Um, um, so the, just the weighted Neumann derivative. And if the uh, medium is not uh, superconducting or insulating, this just boils down to looking at an elliptic equation and the surface voltage to current map is just a directly to Neumann operator. And the inverse question is whether given this directly to Neumann operator, we can recover the unknown conductivity A. And it's now non-linear in the sense that, of course, the directly to Neumann operator depends linearly on A, but in, in this product, but of course, there's a non-linear dependence um, hidden in this U, which makes this very hard. Okay, and so uh, for uh, this first part of the talk, I would like to simplify it um, a little bit even more and say we are looking only at isotropic conductivities in the um, later parts. Um, um, the instability will also hold um, in, in more general settings. Um, and in this case, one can, uh, using the well-known Liouville transform, um, rewrite the problem in terms of a Schrödinger operator where the unknown now sits in the lower order parts of the operator again consider the directly to Neumann map and ask whether given the knowledge of directly to Neumann map, we can recover the potential. And as I said, this is a very well known and very well studied problems with seminal results um, due to Sylvester and Ullmann on injectivity. So this is known and uh, anyways, we wouldn't bother <laughs> about it in this talk. And also stability properties of this, of course, are very well known conditional stability um, was proved uh, by Alessandrini. So under a priori conditions on the potentials, Alessandrini could show that um, this inverse problem enjoys logarithmic uh, stability with uh, the norms not mattering at this point. Okay, but then the natural question one can ask and the natural question one can wonder, and this is a question that Mandata indeed was asking himself, is whether, well, uh, this logarithmic stability sounds terrible. I mean, all the last talk was about uh, somehow trying to get rid of too much logarithmic uh, in, um, stability and improve. So is this logarithmic stability really something inherent in this problem or is this just, um, well, methods or, or lack of being able to prove uh, something better? Okay, and Mandata in fact proved that uh, there is inherent exponential instability in this problem, at least if you're in a very particular geometric setting. So if you're considering 
uh, the unit ball as your domain and consider, let's say, L-infinity potentials, uh, which are supported in a compactly contained set in this unit form. It was later generalized then by De Cristo and Rongi to more general inverse uh, problems and more general uh, inverse problem setting. Okay, but uh, the question uh, that I would uh, again like to ask is, well, um, what, what about geometries uh, that are not so symmetric, not so nice as uh, the unit ball, say something um, that looks more like um, the type of picture I was trying to draw here. And uh, what if um, this potential Q is not compactly supported, but let's say um, lives uh, as a background conducti uh, conductivity or potential in the whole uh, domain? So does in this setting, just as um, uh, the same question as in the heat the setting, does this low regularity setting somehow help? Or uh, does this um, logarithmic um, stability, this exponential instability persist? Okay, and um, so with these two questions, I would like to um, um, turn to um, the ideas of Mandata, which for us, in a sense, were also the starting points of um, looking at, at um, these instability mechanisms. And Mandata's result is also a very, very, very nice uh, result with very, very nice um, ideas. So let me state the result more precisely. So what Mandata proved in the setting of the Calderon problem, that um, if you are restricting yourself to a specific geometry, so the unit ball, and if you're looking at potentials, which are compactly supported um, in uh, this um, um, unit ball, then indeed you cannot do better than the logarithmic stability estimate at least up to uh, powers, um, which Alessandri really proved, in a sense that you find two potentials which are epsilon apart, but uh, whose Dirichlet to Neumann maps are simply squashed to each other in the sense that, I mean, the distances are, are very, very um, um, uh, shrink together in this exponentially strong sense. So you cannot do better than logarithmic is what Mandaka proved and which was very powerful and applied to uh, various other settings. Okay, but even nicer than Mandata's result is Mandata's um, argument. And again, his argument in a sense is the starting point also for our um, argument. So let me uh, briefly recall this. And uh, the maybe nicest thing about this argument is that it's um, um, so so transparent, so, so, so uh, well, clean, um, if, if you know it. So, okay, so Mandaka's argument relies on two observations and only a pigeonholing argument um, following from that. So uh, the two observations is one, a generic observation on function spaces. The second one is a more um, problem specific ingredient, which depends on the Calderon problem in his case and the geometry strongly, strongly depends on the geometry in his case. So uh, what's the first statement? Well, the first statement it's just the observation that um, L infinity and the L infinity, um, I recall, is the class of potentials we're looking at. So L infinity somehow is fat as a metric space. What does that mean? That means if you look at the unit ball in L infinity, possibly intersected with some um, higher regularization, but with the L infinity uh, norm, then it is possible to find large, for any epsilon, it's possible to find large epsilon discrete sets. This means it's possible to find many different potentials, which in L infinity are um, epsilon, at least epsilon mutually apart from each other. So this I try to indicate with this grid um, in L infinity. Okay, so the second ingredient is the problem specific ingredient. And that's the statement um, which um, um, Mandacher proves for the Calderon problem that the Calderon problem, uh, the Dirichlet to Neumann map, or rather this uh, background corrected Dirichlet to Neumann map is enormously um, um, shrinking, enormously compressing um, distances. So he formulates this in terms of uh, essentially the Hilbert-Schmidt um, norm of uh, this background corrected Dirichlet to Neumann map showing that its components have exponential decay. So in terms of a picture, this simply means that the Dirichlet to Neumann operator squashes this fat thing into something very thin in a sense uh, that thin can also be made precise in the sense that for any delta, you find um, um, sm uh, um, a small set that is a, a delta discrete uh, set, so that covers um, this um, image. Okay, but now uh, in Mandata's argument, you're essentially done because you know uh, we start from a potentials Q, which somehow um, are all epsilon apart at least, 
and it is washed together to something which becomes very close, both quantitatively. And so this means that, I mean, you must find uh, two um, images of your Dirichlet to Neumann map, which um, in the pre-image were epsilon apart. Here they are very close. And if you um, quantify this, you end up with exactly the statements that Mandarta did. Okay, and this uh, is exactly also the starting point that we want to look at. Um, so again, there's one um, well, rather general observation and one uh, model specific, and we want to understand whether we can somehow put this into a more general uh, framework. And uh, for that, let me uh, formulate this Mandata result again in a more abstract way. So uh, um, what Mandata has is our two ingredients. One, again, this um, well rather general ingredient, sorry, uh, saying that, uh, I mean, uh, okay, we're interested in this inverse problem given through this map from X to Y. We're looking at restrictions to this compact set. Only there we can hope for stability. And then we have the um, well, general function space ingredient, which says that this compact set K in a sense is fat. This is the um, correspondence to this um, L infinity is fat thing of Mandata, fat in the sense that um, we can find epsilon discrete sets which consists of many um, different um, um, elements. So uh, this is quantified in terms of some function. Okay, and then there's the model specific, problem specific, interesting ingredient that says, well, somehow the image is squashed together by the, the operator and the forward operator. And uh, this is then uh, quantified in a set sense that we say, uh, we, we show that there's some, or he shows that there's some delta net, which consists of only few elements. So you can cover the image with few elements. And then of course, if you do the same pigeon holding argument, assume you have um, some kind of stability estimate, then you get conditions on this modulus of continuity through these two functions. Okay, so then the key, if one wants to uh, um, generalize this to more um, um, general classes of problem um, is to, at least in the first step, try to understand uh, this condition one. So condition two, I mean, this L infinity statement or general function um, statement, this is something that is relatively general, that is not so much problem specific, but understanding one now is important. And we, what um, now is the rest uh, of the talk is understanding uh, mechanisms that give this property one in a quantitative uh, way. About two, we only have to focus in the very end. Okay, so uh, how do we understand um, compression? Well, if we're in a setting of linear problems, uh, that's easy, then we can deal with simply singular values. But if we're in a setting, at least if we're in Hilbert space settings. So if we're not linear, and I mean, the Calderon problem clearly is not linear, then um, 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 we have to think of, of something else. And so the way we, we do this is to use uh, compression uh, to the, quantifications of compression uh, properties of an operator through um, entropy numbers to measure its thinness and capacity numbers to measure its fatness. So uh, more precisely, we consider an operator between some metric Hilbert, whatever Banner space you like, to some metric Hilbert Banner space, whatever you like. And now we measure how fat, uh, it, it, or let's say first thin it is, by looking at the image of the unit ball from the original space now in um, the space Y and uh, try to um, um, cover this image by a prescribed two to the K minus one number of balls and choose the smallest uh, radius which, with which we can still do this. This is the entropy number. So, and this really measures how thin it is because we want to know how many balls we need to cover this thing. Okay, then if we want to know how fat the space is, this is the complementary statement. Uh, we do something similar and use the capacity numbers. So again, we look at the image of the unit ball um, in the space Y. We give ourselves some number, two to the K minus one, and ask how large can epsilon be such that uh, with two to the K minus one um, elements, we still have uh, an epsilon discrete set. So all elements are mutually epsilon apart. So this clearly measures how the fat um, this space is, or the operator, how fat uh, this um, thing still is. And so uh, it's not so surprising that uh, these two numbers somehow measure compactness. So entropy numbers, for instance, go to zero um, with k going to infinity if and only if 
um, that the operator is compact, so you can also make this more quantitative in the form of um, a finite rank or whatever. Um, but so it's not so surprising that these are, are um, notions um, that, that exactly measure the compactness and compression, exactly the, the properties that we would like, and that in Hilbert space settings, this is, uh, can be related to singular values. Okay, so uh, with this um, framework, how um, um, can we say more? Well, so let me recall um, the setting. So we're interested in an operator F, a direct, um, the direct problem mapping between some space X and some space Y. Again, let's say infinite dimensional, Banach, Hilbert, whatever you like in spaces. And we know we have to restrict ourselves to a compact set inside X. And this compact set uh, is just, um, let's say some unit ball in the space X1, which is compactly included in the space um, X. So this compact inclusion in a sense corresponds to uh, this generic statement of Mandache that um, uh, the set uh, that, that L infinity is fat. So this is one ingredient of Mandache. The second ingredient of Mandache is to say, well, um, let's look at the image and try to understand how much the image of the forward operator is compressed. So how much um, is this fat thing compressed to something small? And this we encode um, by understanding uh, the image again in some new function space, y1, which is smaller than the space y. And we want to understand the compression in the uh, quantitative understanding of this inclusion. So then the two ingredients of Mandache really boil down to quantitative statements on these inclusions. So one inclusion, the generic one, tells us, uh, well, the set K should somehow be fat. Um, if we want to use this pigeonholing thing, this is encoded in um, capacity estimates for uh, this first inclusion. And the second thing is the compression, which is the problem specific, more interesting at the moment, at least, ingredient. Uh, this is uh, the question, how much compressed is this um, image in uh, the final function space in which we want to measure stability? And this we simply measure in terms of uh, entropy numbers. And so for any reasonable, let's say, a Sobolev space, um, um, Sobolev scales um, are included with this kind of um, polynomial or, or rational behavior in K. Um, while uh, now different regularities give different types of entropy numbers. So uh, if you have analytic type of smoothing or Jebray type of smoothing, this corresponds to exponential entropy bounds. And this is um, um, something that we'll use in a second. And these two bounds then lead to uh, different, by just the same um, pigeonholing argument, different uh, conditions on this modulus of continuity. So in a sense, all of uh, the things that now uh, we want to understand, boil down to proving these um, uh, lower bounds on the inclusions, but this is generic. So these are, are in a sense very well known in the literature on functional analysis. Uh, while these things here are very model specific and that we uh, want to understand mechanisms giving rise to, let's say, um, polynomial and thus um, Hölder type bounds for the stability, while we under want to also understand when is there really exponential instability. Okay, and so with, with this um, in the back of our minds, let me turn uh, to the first um, problem we had seen earlier. So, uh, and I would like to start with um, the Calderon problem now uh, still in the setting of Mandata that we're in a very, very nice uh, framework. So um, instead of the unit ball, however, now I would like to consider the situation of uh, very nice uh, manifolds. So let's say real analytic manifolds and um, um, do not want to use the symmetry of Mandata anymore. Mandata used the symmetry, uh, I recall, in the second step to prove the compression properties of the image. And uh, so instead of using the symmetries of Mandata, we use now the regularity of um, the manifold. And we can show that uh, with uh, this regularity assumptions on the manifold, this modulus of continuity in this more general Calderon problem still cannot be better than a logarithmic uh, modulus in uh, the Sobolev spaces, but you can also go to other spaces um, through interpolation, um, for instance. And the key here is really the analytic regularization. So if you think of, um, again, the first heuristic, this may be not so surprising. You're in an analytic setup and um, 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 formulate this uh, properly, then um, that, that um, you are very, very compact 
uh, at least after uh, this background correction. It's maybe not so surprising. So, um, um, but uh, it shows that I mean this Mandaka argument and uh, these mechanisms are very robust, and that one does not need to use the specific geometries. But let me not uh, go too much into um, um, this um, very high regularity setting, but turn to the at least initially apparently simpler setting with low regularity. So uh, let let me recall. So the question was, we are looking at um, the heat equation on um, a domain omega, but now with rough coefficients. So uh, the heuristic we just saw previously that analytic regularization should somehow give uh, good properties of the forward operator and thus washing of the forward operator, thus um, bad properties of the backward operator, I mean, the, the inverse problem uh, here doesn't work. So uh, we only have very, very minimal uh, type of regularization, uh, if at all. Okay, but still the claim is that uh, even if you look at the situation with very, very bad um, coefficients, then uh, one cannot construct coefficients which um, need to better uh, stability. So uh, whatever you do for your coefficients, you will have this exponential instability in this problem. Although there's no analytic regularization, so smoothness does not give compression, but uh, it is also compression and not really smoothness that we're interested in in the first place, if you think of Mandaka's argument. Okay, so uh, where does this compression uh, then uh, come from? Well, this compression uh, comes from, if you want, an iteration of, of a tiny minimal amount of global regularization that is still uh, present. So let me explain this a bit more detail. So we're looking at a um, linear inverse problem. So uh, in this case, uh, it suffices to look at um, singular values of the operator we're interested in. And the singular values of the operator is just, I mean, the operator we're interested in, the forward operator is just initial data to final data. And if we can prove that these singular values uh, decay exponentially, then, I mean, you can imagine that um, this ellipse or whatever in, in um, um, the function spaces is extremely uh, compressed and uh, we can apply some kind of pigeon holding argument as in Mandache. Again, so the key really is to prove these um, singular value estimates without computing singular val values, which in our setting with general domains and uh, general operators, of course, we cannot. Okay, so where should this then come from? Well, it's a competition between um, gaining a very tiny little bit of regularity in the form of some kind of Snyberg type bounds, which um, follow from um, essentially an adaptation of uh, some, some results due to Pascal Ocher, Bort, Egert, and Sari, who, whose results can be modified uh, to show that uh, one has a little tiny non-explicit non gain in regularity with respect to initial data. So if you let the solution evolve, you will gain something in regularity. Of course, with the price uh, of scaling in um, the distance you were moving forward. Okay, why does this help? Well, this helps because it allows to factor this map. So it allows to view this map as a map from L2 to um, H delta and back to L2. So there's some kind of compactness gain in between. And uh, for that, uh, we use that um, the, the compactness um, of the identity as an inclusion from H delta to L2 is very well known. It is in fact um, uh, more or less similar to K to the minus delta over N. Okay, so this means if we're looking at a time step S to S plus T, that then the singular values of this single time step behave like this gain, which we get from the compact compactification of, um, I mean, H delta to L2 and the loss we get uh, in terms of scaling of the two norms. So we have something good, which will give smallness and something bad, which will give largeness. So one should think of T as being small. Okay, but now uh, we only, uh, in quotation marks, use um, the um, iteration of singular values or the properties of singular values, iterate this um, estimates uh, N times, get um, this corresponding bound and optimize in N. N then becomes a function of K and yields exactly the singular value bound. So this um, minimal, in spite of only minimal smoothing, 
um, we do get exponential singular value bounds. And so in this sense, uh, compression is the more important mechanism than uh, regularization. Although regularization, of course, is very helpful. Okay, and this uh, indeed one can then also, I mean, the, the previous problem was a linear inverse problem, but this indeed one can then also um, work with for nonlinear problems. Uh, for instance, uh, one can return to uh, the Calderon problem now with a more general coefficients. So this is now um, any metric um, in um, I mean, any elliptic metric you like. You could add uh, drift terms, you could add um, lower order potentials, uh, possibly um, scale invariance, so uh, in the corresponding spaces. And you can prove again with this minimal gain of regularity. So also here, you don't have a huge gain of regularity in contrast to the um, first application of the Calderon problem. You can still prove that you have a minimal gain of regularity in playing a similar game as previously. Uh, you will be able to prove that also in this situation, there are exponential bounds. Of course, it's harder in the sense that, I mean, we're mapping from um, some functions to some operator spaces and uh, understanding what happens in these operator spaces um, um, is a much more uh, work, but uh, the rough idea is a, a similar situation where minimal gain in this type, in this um, setting uh, coming from Mayer's estimate gives enough to iterate to get um, uh, the desired exponential instability in spite of the presence of these very rough coefficients. So rough coefficients do not help at this point. Okay, so this shows uh, two mechanisms. So um, there may be more um, expected mechanism of, of um, well, instability through um, global strong smoothing like analyticity or like a Gervais regularity. The second mechanism, um, that minimal amount of smoothing, which can be iterated to give um, still exponential instability. Okay, and the, the third aspect, which I also would like to um, uh, treat or um, 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 show in this framework, is that of uh, microlocal smoothing. This, of course, is also something um, um, that is well known in the literature. I've just uh, stated a few. Um, references, so uh, I apologize for incompleteness, but um, um, anyways. Okay, so what's what's the problem now? So uh, we've seen elliptic, we've seen uh, parabolic equations, and in both, uh, even though there was maybe only minimal smoothing, um, there was some kind of global uh, smoothing. And so now uh, in the still same Mandata type in quotation marks framework, we would also like to understand um, instabilities in, let's say, hyperbolic or transport or whatever you like um, type of problems which do not enjoy uh, global smoothing properties. Okay, so what to do then? Well, um, um, the key is uh, already uh, present in the literature. So uh, we want to use that there still is maybe not global smoothing, but still micro local smoothing and want to do this within our framework. So uh, let me recall then uh, our framework and now specialize uh, our spaces to um, um, some Sobolev spaces. So we are looking still as a map, uh, at a map, um, the direct problem between some space, which now is a Sobolev space and some other Sobolev space. And in this space want to measure stability or instability and see what kind of conditions come from the operator and what kind of conditions come from the choice of the compact set. And so now, of course, I mean, lacking uh, global uh, regularization, we cannot simply say um, up, upstairs here, we simply map from some nice compact set into an image, it must be squashed. This is not true for all directions, of course, and this is known, of course, also in the literature. So, okay, instead of looking at um, an arbitrary compact set in um, some uh, HS space um, down here, what we do in order to also put this into this Mandata type framework is to first apply some um, um, zeroth order pseudo differential operator, which localizes into the part uh, in which we do have uh, some kind of analytic, let's say, smoothing of our um, linear or nonlinear uh, map. And then from this set, now we can use the previous machinery if we have this um, a localization, micro localization given. We can uh, then from this set again obtain an analytically smoothing operator. We can apply exactly the same framework as previously 
with um, the entropy and uh, capacity arguments, for instance. But there's one thing we have to think about, and this one thing is whether um, um, this application of this uh, zero order pseudo differential operator somehow makes uh, the initial space too small. And um, uh, well, uh, what, what one wants to argue is that this is not the case if, uh, let's say, the operator is non characteristic at some point. And um, that uh, essentially, I mean, whether we work with um, the smaller set, which only sees the directions in which our operator is moving, or the original set, uh, doesn't really matter in terms of capacity, the numbers of the original space. And in fact, this is something one can prove either by constructing directly, as um, 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 for instance is done in the literature, um, wave packets which somehow um, um, give epsilon discrete uh, sets in the pre-image or more indirectly by proving vile type bounds for uh, this micro localizing uh, operator. And so with this, uh, one can again put this into the framework I, I was showing previously for elliptic and parabolic operators, but now use it for non-elliptic or non-parabolic operators. I've stated the condition here for the situation that uh, you have, let's say, smoothing after restricting yourself in uh, phase space uh, to the proper cones, but you could also phrase this in uh, phase space still if you're uh, um, and with thus um, logarithmic instability estimates if you're, uh, let's say, analytically or better Gervais, because Gervais is easier to handle in terms of cutoff functions um, uh, settings. So uh, this is only one condition that um, one can look at. Okay, and uh, of course, this can also be rephrased in terms of um, the operators directly. So this is um, something that is encoded um, in um, um, the Schwartz kernels of um, the operators we're interested in. So uh, if we know that we have an operator which is micro-locally smoothing at some point, in the sense that um, the kernel doesn't produce new singularities, and that we control how singularities are propagated, then uh, we can prove if this is just smoothing in a non-quantitative way that one cannot have better bounds than um, um, any, uh, I mean, that one has worse instability than any Hölder instability. If one knows a bit more quantitative behavior, so if one knows that it's say Gervais the micro-locally smoothing, then one can prove similarly that they're logarithmic. Um, instability uh, bounds. And again, the idea is to apply the uh, previous uh, framework into uh, this setting. Okay, and what uh, is an example? Well, again, I'm not giving the uh, most general and most exciting maybe example. This is something uh, that also in the literature is uh, well known, but it's more about the, the uh, mechanisms that uh, I, I'm trying to focus in the talk. So uh, one example would, for instance, be um, the Radon transform which uh, measures integrals of a function along uh, lines, uh, along certain uh, directions. And now, of course, it's known that if one looks at the Radon transform with full data, everything is nice in the uh, right function spaces. But it's also known that if one looks at the Radon transform with partial data only, that uh, this is expected to be highly um, unstable. And uh, with the previous mechanism, we can indeed uh, prove this and prove that you cannot we do better, uh, I mean, we prove this, um, you cannot do better than um, logarithmic um, stability if you want to prove something positive. So necessarily your modulus of continuity is bounded below by this um, logarithm if you restrict yourself to partial um, data. And of course, uh, what's the idea here? The idea is just to um, write down um, the Radon transform as an oscillatory integral. Uh, you, one thus understands very well how singularities propagate and uh, simply apply the previous um, um, framework uh, in uh, this set. Okay, but uh, let me not uh, go too much into the details of this, but um, instead um, summarize. So uh, I tried to uh, convey three instability mechanisms, all based on compression properties, compression properties of the forward operator. So we only have to analyze the forward operator. Then, um, so there are three mechanisms, one being global um, strong regularization in the sense of, for instance, smoothing or even quantitative smoothing, so Gervais smoothing, analytic smoothing, 
as it is uh, present in, in elliptic or parabolic equations with uh, constant coefficients or smooth analytic uh, coefficients. But um, then as a second step show that this is not necessary for uh, these compression bounds, already minimal global smoothing um, suffices to prove these instabilities. And finally, that uh, also this framework can be used to prove microlocal uh, to, to include uh, non-elliptic, non-parabolic operators, so say hyperbolic or um, here more transport type problems in using um, microlocal uh, regularization uh, mechanisms. And uh, um, this is not only interesting for, for instance, for the inverse problem problems I was showing, but can, for instance, also use the dual uh, problems from uh, control theory, if you, for instance, think of uh, the wave equation and controllability, say, for the wave equation, for instance. Okay, with this, uh, I think I have uh, taken enough of your time, and thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Ankana, for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments, please? Any questions or, or comments, please? Please unmute yourself. So in uh, hyperbolic equ uh, equations, uh, of course, there's very uh, strong propagation of singularities along the bi-characteristics. So what mm -hmm. you're doing is looking at initial data that don't have singularities that would propagate that way with the, mm -hmm. with the, with the operator P that you put in there. Sorry, I, I didn't get the question. Maybe it's acoustically. Uh, I mean, this. I'm talking about the operator P that you yeah. put in, in the uh, well, hyperbolic uh, equations. So this cuts away uh, things in initial data that would propagate. Sure. Propagate. Sure. Aha. Uh -huh. So so this operator P. Uh, right, I mean, we want to view this exactly in the sense of, of um, the setting uh, of, let's say, if you want elliptic or parabolic problems where we only, I mean, where we only have global smoothing. So, I mean, um, um, if we know that we have an operator which um, um, regularizes micro locally in certain directions, then what we say is, okay, we only want to see these directions in phase space, everything else uh, we just throw away. And this is what the operator P does. So it uh, localizes in phase space to the part that is um, um, regularized, be it smooth, smoothly regularized or analytically regularized or Javray regularized or whatever. Uh, so it focuses on this part or this cone in phase space. And all the rest um, we take on, on all the rest, we simply take P to be um, let's say zero. So, I mean, only in this cone, you should think of it as being the identity everything, everywhere else is the trivial um, the part. And so uh, then, I mean, this is why I, I was saying one has to think about whether um, um, the set doesn't become too small. So, I mean, uh, how large this um, original set is in the Sobolev space is of course very well known that for this, you have entropy bounds, upper and lower bounds. While now you're throwing away a lot and you have to make sure that you're not throwing away too much. And one way how to do it is, of course, um, to, to look at wave packets which live in the cone you're interested in where you have smoothing. Another way is to look at um, uh, this operator directly and prove um, vial bounds for this operator. So count singular values for this operator. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments or questions, please? I, I have a question. Please. Uh, about uh, uh, the Calderon problem. Mm -hmm. uh, if you uh, assume that uh, the, uh, the unknown coefficients uh, is an uh, analytic class, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the domain is analytic, I expect a uh, heterogeneous continuous stability estimate, but uh, uh, do you know if um, uh, still in this case, we have uh, only a, a logarithmic 
uh, stability estimate. Okay, so so maybe two two points on that. So. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, what you expect is, I mean, if you make this hat um, um, K very small and you uh, look only at uh, the very, very nice functions, then um, somehow stuff should improve. So, uh, I mean, if you think of the heat equation, then, um, I mean, if you look at, I don't know, analytic initial data um, where you have good decay of the singular values, you expect that things get better. That's the kind of intuition that is behind this, right? And so, uh, um, um this is this is how how making k smaller could help but um still in this um, um calderon setting it's not um, the choice of uh, taking k uh, small so much it's the uh, it, and it, i mean okay maybe i should have stated this i didn't say this properly so this potent i mean the metric g is is analytic the potential q is at infinity so uh, I don't, um, I mean, this is still um, um, something, but well, this is not rough, but I mean, it's still something that is not making the space K tiny. So the space K in this formulation is still a large set. So uh, K is um, uh, fat in, in, in Mandaka's sense, even though well, the metric is smooth. Even if uh, uh, all the derivative of Q to one and to two are, uh, bounded uh, in an analytic sense. Uh, the, the so, so this statement is not about Q analytic. The statement, so the statement I formulated here, I should have been more, more careful in stating it. So the statement with the logarithmic stability is a statement for Q not analytic. G okay, is analytic, okay. but Q is not analytic. But I see, I understand okay, your okay. point. So what you want to do is you make the set K small and get better properties, I agree. But uh, what this states is, uh, um, K is still large. And uh, what this is about is saying, we want to get a bit away from Mandaka, which uses a lot of symmetry. So, I mean, you use the spherical harmonics in the ball, you use uh, that really, you have a nice symmetry. This year still is nice symmetry in the sense that you have some smoothing in the problem, but uh, it's much more general. We're not touching um, singular value basis explicitly. Right. But I should have been more careful, definitely, in uh, stating that Q is, is still in L affinity, I agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Hi, uh, this is Rakesh. I have one question regarding your hyperbolic results. Mm -hmm. so, so I see that as the dual result to these uh, poor continuity, uh, you're able to get unique continuation results for mm -hmm. hyperbolic problems I gathered then, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this would be a different technique than say using Kalimann estimates or like the Taru type arguments where the coefficient. No, so, um, so, so I, I mean, it's not, it's not, I mean, our, all, all our results are on the bad side in a sense. I mean, all our results are on the unstable side. We're not in the stable side. So for example, can you give an example of one of the unique continuation results that you have? Right, so a unique continuation statement, uh, I've taken it out for time reasons, would have been um, saying that, I mean, you look at, um, um, I mean, the, the unique continuation setting for, for um, the, the wave equation. So you prescribe initial data, initial um, velocities, and you give yourself an open set, um, which is smaller than your overall manifold. And you want to observe your solution from this open set. So from this small open set, you want to recover your solution globally or your initial data if you prefer. And so what our result would tell in that situation is that uh, um, the modulus of continuity from um, um, the observation to the initial data in whatever essentially any Sobolev space you like is not better than logarithmic in general. And the dual result, the dual result would be a controllability result giving you an estimate on the cost of controllability, saying that um, you have to pay at least some amount uh, of, of uh, a certain size, uh, I mean, a quantitative size, so in this case, exponential, depending on the way you want to approximate um, for, for controllability. But it's, not, it's, it's on the negative side, in a sense. So it's on the instable side. It's not on the stable side. OK. And so th these, th these things are in your article then, right? You have examples mm -hmm. of such results in your article? Sure. Okay, all right.
Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Uh, I have a question. Please. Yes. So if you're talking about the hyperbolic, like the wave equation, so when the frequency becomes larger and larger, uh, that means your image space will become bigger and bigger, right? So there's some dependence of your image space with respect to your problem also. Uh, sure. So it, it, how that affect this kind of stability? Well, I, I'm not sure but I, I understand the question um, um, correctly, but I mean, if you, for instance, um, look at the same type of, of um, question that was the problem topic of, of the last talk, uh, I mean, increasing stability kind of things, increasing with, with um, um, the, the parameter, I mean, this is something that one could, um, um, I mean, that is known in Mandaka's framework, original framework. I mean, I cited, um, uh, for instance, this uh, recent article by um, Jen Nan Wang, uh, Gunther Ullmann, and a student of uh, Jen Nan. Um, I mean, there's work by, by Katja uh, on the stable side, for instance. Um, so, I mean, one could um, also uh, phrase this and the bounds one has to prove for this, for instance, in, in our framework, what one would have to do is uh, prove the corresponding um, entropy and capacity estimates depending on this parameter, sure. Um, but I'm not sure whether this is what you were asking. Yeah, that's, that, that is what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? I was just going to ask a question, actually. So I'm not sure um, what the, the current state is here, um, but uh, um, the last time I checked, there had been some question over what happens with the stability of the Calderon problem with um, partial data. Um, so I guess there's a, there's a stability result that says that the, the if you take the Calderon problem with partial data, um, then, then you get a stability result of log log type. And I guess there was some question um, for a while about whether this is optimal. Um, and I was wondering if, if you know if, if this work says anything about that. I, I like this question very much and I've been thinking about this question also very much, uh, but I cannot give an answer. I mean, I, I just don't, I mean, I don't know. Okay. But I like it a lot. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, this lower bound. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Ankana, for the great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much.